I'm now joined by two guests uh, from Bank J. Safra Sarazin, Andreas Nick. On my left, he's head of US and global sustainable equities. And Sasha Bezlik, he is managing director, head of sustainable business development, joining me from his office. Andreas and Sasha, thank you so much for joining. Sasha, in May 2020, Jay Safra Sarazin Asset Management launched a climate pledge aiming for a carbon neutral outcome by 2035. What does the company focus on here? We have worked with uh, sustainable finance and investments for a number of years, and the climate pledge is one of the areas where we further develop the work that we already done for many years. In the pledge, we outline our commitment to be a carbon neutral asset management firm by 2035. It means that the assets that we manage from now on until the 2035 will on annual basis decrease the exposure to fossil heavy industries by 7% and by doing so we aim at being one of the few asset management firms that actually can deliver this by 2035. It is ambitious pledge but in the same time it indicates the commitment we have that we think it's the right thing to do and we have both knowledge and experience to do so. Aiming for a carbon neutral outcome in assets under management by 2035. This is quite a challenge. What does this mean for the company, but also for your investors? I think the most important thing is that we can deliver competitive and good performance products to our clients. And uh, by doing that, and uh, doing so, we need to take into account a tremendous shift that is taking place across different industries towards more sustainable outcomes. What I mean by that is that we are one of the few asset managers uh, today that can clearly indicate to our clients what they get when they receive uh, our funds and, and our discretionary mandates across different asset classes. And we can show in what way throughout the reporting and very elaborate uh, forward-looking climate engine how we tackle one of the biggest investment, I would call it investment challenges in the world right now, which is the climate emergency. Uh, it is ambitious, as you said, but it's also uh, a way for us to clearly indicate that we as a firm, uh, both as a, as a asset management firm, as a bank, are firmly committed to support transition to sustainable future. Let me talk about the investors too. How do they cope with that, Sasha? I think investors in general are at the, at the space right now. You can see that throughout the last couple of years. Uh, in the space where they clearly see that they need to shift the way how they invest money and lend money across the world. So throughout the 2021, you will see not only a lot of pledges, but also a lot of focus on how uh, investors specifically in Europe through the SFDR, which is this, uh, the, the new sort of a way of how the funds should describe how they contribute to certain sustainability issues and the EU taxonomy. All of these sort of a frameworks will lead to much higher transparency, but also bigger pressure on investors to be able to showcase to their clients what do they actually get when they invest in these type of products. Andy, let me turn to you. Um, you want to go beyond ESG. How can you do that? What, we're, what we developed is what we call the climate engine. And that is, you know, how do the question is, how do we get to the lower carbon output and how do portfolios look like in the future to achieve that goal? And what we did is we basically looked at two things. On the one hand, we have what we call climate pledgers. Those are companies that are on a good path themselves to lower their own carbon footprint. And then we have what we call green champions. And those are companies that will help others to reduce the carbon emissions. And uh, basically, those are the two, the two buckets that we look for in finding companies that are on a good path towards carbon neutrality in 2035. Do you want to give us a few examples of those companies in those two buckets? Yes, I would love to, because I think it makes more sense with examples, as always. In, in uh, the green champions, I think the most obvious examples might be a renewable companies like Vestas that makes the wind turbines. Could also be an insulation company uh, that makes insulation in buildings that will then use less heating. 
And climate pledgers are companies that do a very good job themselves in lowering their own carbon footprint. So here, what that gives us is it gives us a chance to look beyond the traditional renewable companies into other companies in other sectors that are also doing a very good job in reducing their own carbon uh, footprint. And uh, for this, we've actually developed our own engine our own temperature path to calculate on which path these companies are on and we would only invest in those companies that are on a low path. So you need the green light from the engine? You need the green light from the engine so to speak, yes. <laughs> um, we've been talking a lot of measuring um, impact and performance, something which is very important for the investors as well. Um, what do you mean by measuring the impact and performance? Yeah, you know, it goes beyond just the performance, like Sasha said, and, and what we measure is, is we want to really know what percentage of revenues are green for a company. And so if you have an insulation company, I'll just use an example, Kingspan, it's a well-known company from Ireland that provides insulation for mostly commercial buildings. And, you know, you need to know, um, it's, is, it, is it material that qualifies? And Sasha mentioned the EU taxonomy. They've given us a framework that will help us to find the companies and they also stipulate what is required to fulfill the measurement. So they actually tell us what kind of a thermal capability the insulation needs. And then we can, we actually contacted Kingspan ourselves and we asked them that question because right now you don't find the information yet in the in the official reports we think in the future you will and they basically told us what they think what percentage of their revenues qualifies according to the taxonomy so in that example we say kingspan has 60 percent green revenues and that would be enough to be a green champion would you say 2021 is going to be crucial for esg investments i think all the years coming are crucial, yes, absolutely. And I think the transition has just begun. We forget that sometimes, you know, you, you think you're, there's already lots that happen, but when you look into the future, what you realize is actually this is just a very small step. If you want to go, and we're not the only ones that are thinking about carbon neutrality, the whole world's thinking about it. If that's going to happen, it's going to happen in a much bigger way than what we are seeing right now. And I think you'll see it, like you'll see it in, I'll just take an example, wind. There's going to be a lot of actions for off offshore wind projects this year and and I think once these once these projects come up for bidding once you get you know that that'll make people realize wow there's going to be far more power generated this way than what we have right now and I think that'll be that'll happen this year there'll be the same thing happening next year or the year after so it's not just about 2021 but it's the next you know for us it'll be until 2035 for some countries until 2050. Sasha, turning back to you, looking at the global picture again, 2021, how crucial is it going to be um, um, from your point of view? And, you know, what are the next steps that we are going to expect here in this term? I think the decade between 2020 and 2030 is key. I mean, uh, if we look at the amount of uh, CO2 uh, emissions around the world right now, it clearly indicates that we are still not on the path where we need to be. Financial sector is a toolbox that can be used to, to transform uh, the huge amounts of capital towards uh, solutions. And that needs to happen in, at much larger scale and much faster speed. And this is something that, I mean, clearly European Union has indicated its willingness to do that. We are expecting to see uh, big changes in, in the US. Uh, there are certain signals that things are happening in Asia as well. I think the focus is to really, uh, both on the investments and the lending side, uh, make a consistent shift. And this is in our you know, business as an active asset management house across different asset classes ranges. We are clearly developing the solutions, investment solutions for institutional and private banking clients where we see that uh, the integration of, of ESG and also to a certain extent engagement activities, which in our case are driven by investments, not purely by engaging for the sake of engaging, but engaging for the sake of investments improvements, we see that this will uh, make a big difference going forward. So in a couple of years' time, you may have a lot of uh, asset managers who have run into the ESG space and will withdraw from that because they will not feel that they can fulfill most of these requirements that are going up and not fulfill the client expectations. But I also think that you will see much more innovation in the financial space, both on the product side, but also on the, on the way how uh, financial capital can be deployed to, to support this transition. 